The Financial Crisis, What Happened and Why. Lecture 3. All right, let's get started. I want to start off by, uh, we ended last time uh, talking about Fetty and Fannie and about their growing role in, uh, in the housing market and about the, the accounting problems they had and the kind of the political backing they got. I just thought I'd read you a, a quote from Bonnie Frank from 2003 to give you, give you a sense of uh, what was going on. Um, this is for Bonnie. Freddie, uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have played a very useful role in helping make housing more affordable. Critics exaggerate a threat of safety and conjure up the possibility of serious financial losses to the Treasury, which I do not see. And he goes on to say, I would like to get Freddie and Fannie more deeply into helping low-income housing and possibly moving into something that is more explicitly a subsidy. I want to roll the dice a little more in this situation towards subsidized housing. Right. So Bonnie rolled the dice. He used Freddie and Fannie to roll the dice, and we are paying the price, at least partially, for that rolling of the dice. You can see here that uh, you know Freddie and Fannie initiated this idea of buying up mortgages. This was something that was that they really started. Um, after the Great Depression, it's something that grew over time, and really, as uh, as they became private in the '60s, this whole idea grew dramatically of buying up mortgages. And you can see that <coughs> that uh, in 1980, 84 and a half percent of all mortgages in the United States were kept by the banks. They held on to them, so they had a clear interest in making sure that these mortgages paid back because they were the beneficiaries directly. By 2008, second quarter of 2008, 59% of all mortgages are already being sold, okay, are being shifted to the Fetties, the Fannies, but also to the investment banks. And the investment banks are now competing openly with Freddie and Fannie, and we'll see what they do with the securities in a, in a little while. We'll see what they do once they buy these mortgages and why they're buying them. But there's a whole industry now dedicated to buying these mortgages, and that includes uh, the subprime. These are subprime. These are the really risky mortgages. And this is a number of them that are securitized. And again, we'll talk about what securitized is. But the idea here is they're being bought by others, so the bank itself is not holding on to them, and you can see the sharp increase <clears throat> into the uh, into the mid 2000s, uh, even as late as two, middle of 2008. Uh, a huge number of a uh, huge percentage of all subprime mortgages are being bought by Wall Street and by Freddie and Fannie, by Freddie and Fannie, and then securitized. This is the amount of money people are taking out of their homes. Probably should have showed it to you earlier. This is the amount of money people are taking out of their homes in home equity. Right? This is cashing out of home equity during this period. Just look at, again, what happens starting in 2003 and then certainly in 05 and 06 and 07. You know, this is where a lot of that consumption comes from. This is what I was talking about in terms of people using their home basically as an ATM machine to generate this. Okay, one other element of Fetty and Fannie, <clears throat> which is really crucial. Um, we talked about leverage last time, right? We talked about the fact that as you become more and more leveraged, you become what? More and more leverage means what? More risk, more risk because you got more debt, more and more debt, which makes you more vulnerable. Right? You've got less equity. And we gave the, the example of the house. If you put down you know, $3,000 for a $100,000 house, then all that has to happen is the house has to drop by $3,000 in value and you're wiped out. And you still owe the $97,000. Right? But if you put down $50,000 in a $100,000 house, the $3,000 drop in the value of your house is no big deal. You've lost 6%, but it's not a huge loss, right? you can still survive. You only owe 50000 on the house, you still have 47000 worth of equity in the house. So leverage makes things much more risky, but of course much more profitable on the upside, right? Because if you make $10,000 in the house, you took $3,000 invested, that's the $3,000 of equity you have in the house, and you've tripled it, more than tripled it, 
If you have, oh, if you have fifty thousand dollars in a house, a ten thousand dollar increase is twenty percent. That's nice, but that's not tripling your money. So leverage dramatically increases risk, and increases return if things go well. Okay. Now, leverage is used very creatively in financial markets, and some really, really aggressive players like hedge funds get to the point where they have 30 times more debt than equity. That's huge, right? So 30 times, for every dollar of equity they have, they have $30 of debt, okay? That's hugely risky, right? And they manage that risk. They, they take positions where they can manage that risk. They can do so in financial markets. So they're very, very sophisticated investors who know what they're doing, at least. Most of them do, and mo at least most of them think they do. Some of them discover later on that they don't, and they get wiped out, and they go out of business. And hedge fund business is a pretty volatile business. Okay. Uh, long-term capital, remember long-term capital? Long-term capital was a hedge fund that went basically bankrupt in 1998, was bailed out by the banks under the guidance of the Federal Reserve. Uh, long-term capital was leveraged 90 to 1. I mean, on believable. $90 of debt for every $1 of equity. And something crazy happened to the world uh, and, and they lost enough to really get wiped out. But it doesn't take much to get wiped out when you're 90 to 1. And these were really smart investors. And yeah. Sometimes I thought there was a limit of 12 to 1 after the big crash back then. 12 to 1 is the limit that commercial banks have. Long-term capital is a hedge fund. It's not regulated. It's not limited. The market limits it. The market should limit it. But, of course, when these things keep getting bailed out, it's hard for the market to have much discipline. But, no, there's no regulatory limit on hedge funds. And, again, most hedge funds can handle it. They deal with it. They've got very sophisticated methodologies, and long-term capital certainly thought they could deal with it. They had two... Nobel Prize, laureates in economics on their board of directors, and they had all the mathematical models, and they thought they could deal with it. Okay, so uh, long-term capital, 90 to 1. Fannie Mae, 244 to 1. 244 to 1. So the riskiest hedge funds that we know of, the one that took on the most leverage ever that I know of was 90 to 1, and that was long-term capital. Government-sponsored entity guaranteed by the U.S. Treasury, regulated like crazy by all kinds of government regulators, 244 to 1. The more conservative, Freddie, was only 167 to 1. I mean, this is the kind of nuttiness that you get when the government interferes in markets. And people were throwing money at these entities, right? They were throwing money at them. Why? Because it was guaranteed. They believed it was guaranteed. It was like deposit insurance. Yeah. Are those ratios, are those ratios today or before uh, the government? Those ratios, uh, let's see, green is Q2 of 2008. 2006, Fannie was 58 to 1, and Freddie was uh, something around the same. In, in the 50s to 1. Right. Repeat the question, Joe. Yes, repeat the question. Okay. So the question was, uh, were those ratios today? But those ratios as of beginning of 2008. Okay. Yeah. Can I go back to the securitization? No. In a free market? <laughs> no. What securitization? No. <laughs> no. I'll, I haven't gotten to securitization. Let me get to securitization, then you can deal with securitization. Yeah, I don't. The ratio you know, of itself is scary, but isn't the underlying equity also less secure by the nature of what's, what it's a factor to? Makes it yes, hard. yes. I mean, they're backing mortgages, and we know what happened to the mortgages, right? And of course, but you know, equity, what happened to the equity of Freddie and Fannie? It got wiped out. It got wiped out, went to zero. Uh, the equity got wiped out uh, in Freddie and Fannie because the government took them over. Wiped out the equity, wiped out what's, co what's called uh, the preferred shares, which a lot of banks around the country actually held, which hurt, one of the things that really hurt the banking industry was the, when the government wiped out the preferred shares that banks were holding, they view it as secured capital because they believe the government would never, would never let 
that Freddie and Fannie go bust. But they lost a lot of community banks, smaller banks around the country, lost a huge amount of their capital when those shares were wiped out. And all the government paid out, all the government secured, really, were the debt holders. And the debt holders were pension plans, insurance companies, and a lot of Chinese and Japanese and foreigners who had bought this like they would buy government treasuries because they viewed them as equally secure. Just here there was a slightly higher return because remember the implicit, the guarantee was implicit, not explicit, right? Everybody assumed the government would bail all the debt holders out, but there wasn't, it wasn't 100%, so there was a slightly higher return that they got on uh, Freddie and Fannie. So that's Freddie and Fannie Mac. You can see the kind of risk they took, the kind of political incentive they had, you know, the number, the amount of mortgages they were taking on. And, and we'll see. The private markets participate in this as well to a large extent because Freddie and Fannie created this market and facilitated this market. You know, how it would have evolved without them is really hard to tell. But that's not the whole story, of course. The government intervenes in housing in many different ways. Freddie and Fannie was just one of them. We've talked about the mortgage insurance last time. But there's also, and you hear about this a lot, the Community Reinvestment Act. That Community, Community Reinvestment Act was passed originally in 1977 by the Carter administration with the idea that, this, that banks were redlining. That is, banks were saying the certain ethnic groups that we don't want to lend to, the certain neighborhoods we don't want to go into, and therefore Congress thought that it would step in and force them to lend into those neighborhoods. And each bank would get a rating by the regulator, regulator in terms of whether it satisfied a requirement of a certain percentage being lent to, low, to you know, particular ethnic groups, particular neighborhoods, low-income low income people. Okay? Now, originally, this thing didn't have much teeth, and it wasn't a big deal, and the banks found ways around it. Yeah, they opened up maybe branches in some areas they wouldn't have otherwise. They made a few loans they wouldn't have otherwise. But generally, it wasn't followed much. People didn't pay much attention to that. That started a change in the, 19, uh, in the 1990s. Um, in 1989, they made the CRA rating, the Community Reinvestment Act's rating public, so everybody could see it. It was required that banks, know, you know, let in, in part of their public disclosures, let everybody knows, know what it is. But really the big change was in 1995 under Clinton when they gave the bills some teeth. Basically, the regulators were now required to take into account a bank's CRA rating whenever a merger was being considered. So they would not approve a merger if either the buyer or the seller didn't have an adequate CRA rating. And this is 1995, probably among the most intense merger activity among banks in American history. 1994, there was a bill passed that allowed for the first time in American history interstate banking. You could, for the first time, bank, you know, open a branch or buy banks anywhere in the country except the one state that opted out of this bill was Texas, um, which today, which today is under the bill, but it, you know, it got, it, it got a certain uh, extension. It's uh, typical of Texans. Uh, they want it, Texans want Texas banks owned by Texans. We don't want no, they, you know, they don't want no foreigners owning their banks. Um, having lived in Texas, that's really their attitude. So, Banks are consolidating like crazy through the 90s. Suddenly, a bank has to face this barrier of the CRA rating. And, and there's a group out there, there's community, leftist community group out there that uh, Glenn Beck makes a big deal out of and, and has done a number of shows on them called Acorn. Yeah. And Acorn's whole shtick during the 90s was stopping bank mergers and squeezing the banks so everything they could in order to withdraw their objection to the merger. And the whole objection, the basis of the objective, they would dig up statistics to show that the bank wasn't doing enough community reinvestment stuff. And this was going on throughout the 80s, and Acon made hundreds of millions of dollars because they cut deals with the banks, where the banks would pay them off, or the banks would set up a fund. 
that was that the bank and Acorn managed together to distribute mortgages and loans in low-income neighborhoods. And it was a, there was a whole array of, of programs that banks set up in order not to face this obstruction, in order not to face the slowdown. Fleet, you remember Fleet Bank here in Boston, in Massachusetts? I can't say, I think Bank of America bought Fleet. And when Bank of America bought Fleet, that merger was slowed down because of CRA, and they had to cut a deal. They had to cut a deal with the regulators, they had to cut a deal with Acorn, in order to get that deal approved around this community, around allocating more funds in the new merged bank for low-income lending, for lending in certain neighborhoods. And this, this accelerated during the 90s, and banks turned it into just part of the business. You put certain money aside for those kind of neighborhoods. And, you know, I think, again, that did CRA play a huge role in this? No. We've talked about the things that I think played a huge, huge role in it. But just at the margin, it put more money at play in those neighborhoods where people could not afford to pay back their, mor- their mortgages. It put more into subprime. It put more into what's called Alt-A mortgages, the, the non-prime mortgages. Just at the margin, there's more of it. So when the crash happens, it's more dramatic. Okay. Now, people, a lot of people say, well, CRA, CRA only affects banks. And yet, a lot of the mortgages that were issued, particularly subprime mortgages, were not done by banks. They were by mortgage brokers who don't fall under CRA. And that is true. But that doesn't mean they weren't regulated, and that doesn't mean they weren't political pressure on them to do CRA-type lending. And indeed, there was. In, starting in 1993, HUD, the um, Housing and Urban Development uh, Department, began, legal, uh, began bringing legal action against mortgage bankers who were found to have too little you know, minority lending. So if your portfolio was composed primarily of white people and mortgages, uh, you know, issued to whites, you were sued under a variety of civil rights laws for discrimination. Now, again, it depended on where you were. Of course, the population was all 100% white in your, in your area. That was one thing. But if you were in a more mixed area, you were sued under civil rights legislation. So there was intensifying pressure throughout the 1990s on everyone in this business to deal with lower income populations. This came from Congress, but it also came from the White House. I mean, George Bush in 1903, 1903, I told you this conference, it's about the right time for it to end. Um, 2003 went to Atlanta. And a big, he made a major speech in Atlanta about housing policy and about the importance of housing to values and to the ownership society and therefore how important it was for minorities to own homes. And while whites had already achieved above 70% home ownership rates, uh, blacks and Latinos were lagging and how his administration was dedicated to achieving home ownership among minorities. And therefore, you know, there's a lot of use of the bully pulpit, if you will, to try to get people to lend into those neighborhoods, to encourage people. And they even said, look, if the, if the lending standards are what's holding this back, things like documenting income and things like, uh, you know, any other things that, like whether you have 20% of put down, right? If those are barriers... Then we need to loosen those barriers. We need to loosen those constraints, those unjust constraints. And if somebody can afford a mortgage, why bother with income verification? I don't know what afford a mortgage means if you can't verify income. If somebody can afford the monthly payments, why worry about a down payment? You know, not understanding the whole impact leverage has, right? And you could see after the, this rhetoric how across the entire spectrum of entities, from banks to mortgage brokers, and of course guided by, the, by uh, um, FHA and by, uh, and by Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, how the standards start getting looser and looser. The requirements for documentations get looser and looser. And, and, and again, Bonnie Frank and all these guys encouraging this. They're, they're 
preaching it. They're telling the bankers to do this, and, they, and they're promising to go after them if they don't. How the standards documentation gets those are down payments. You get mortgages where there's no down payment or there's three and a half percent. Some of them can get insurance from the government. So more and more money flows into these risky sectors, into people who can't afford them, and more and more into the hands of speculators. Like, as I told you last time, the woman who cuts my hair. Okay, so what have we seen so far? We've seen, we've talked about the importance of interest rates. We've talked about how interest rates are this crucial price in the economy that coordinates almost everything that happens. All investment decisions, saving decisions, and consumption decisions are based on interest rates. And we talked about the fact that when the Fed sets the interest rate, the very existence of the Fed causes that interest rate to be an artificial interest rate, not to reflect the true preferences of the investing, saving, consuming consumers out there in the public, right? in the economy. And that that creates an illusion because there's a price, but that price is not being dictated by supply and demand. That price is being dictated by Alan Greenspan or Bernanke, by fiat, by some random rule of thumb that they happen to have. And that that price now distorts all investment and consumption choices that people have. And I, and I want to emphasize that is really at the core. That is the fundamental problem here. Those low interest rates, in early, in, in starting in 2001, but really hitting bottom in 2003, staying at the bottom in, through 2004, that is the real cause of the problem here. All the distortions, everything that's happened since then, the, the, the primary cause of that is are the distortions created by a wrong interest rate. And we know it's wrong in this case. We know it's too low because, as we said, we don't know what the real interest rate is because we don't have supply and demand. We don't have an alternative universe where people are free to actually you know, trade in loadable funds. All we have is this false price. But we know in this case that it was too low because of what? It was a negative real rate of return. It was a negative real interest rate. It was below the rate of inflation, which is just crazy, <laughs> which would never happen in a free market. So we know it was too low. And we know in part when interest rates are too low, you get lots of consumption and you get long-term investment. And we saw that both in the internet bubble and we saw it in the housing bubble. We also see that part of the reason it went into housing is not just because low interest rates, mortgages, variable rate mortgages, all of that, you know, encourages that kind of debt, taking out that kind of debt, particularly the existence of, of uh, adjustable rate mortgages, but also government policy. Government policy during the late 90s, early 2000s were pushing investment into housing, low-income housing, was pushing people to, you know, the banks and the financial institutions to make housing a big deal. And again, the, the, the bubble kind of piggybacked off of that trend that it was already happening. We saw tax policy uh, geared towards more housing and, of course, Freddie and Fannie Community Reinvest Reinvestment Act, everything else, at the same time as the standards are deteriorating for quality. And risk is going up. And this interest rate environment piggybacks off of that and really blows this up. Yeah? Could you, at some appropriate time, sort of delineate... Uh, the difference between what might be called progressive economists, say like Krugman, and your views, I'm sure that everybody would agree on the facts, the historical facts, but somehow they reach a different conclusion. I don't have time, unfortunately, to go into, you know, the nonsense that is Keynesian economics. And I think it's a compliment to call Krugman a, an economist. Uh, so the question is, can I go into, can I, can I go into kind of, what would, the, what would the opposition say? What would Krugman say to what I'm arguing? I just don't have time to do that. Keynesian economics is pretty complex. Um, but the bottom line, I can, let me tell you, though, what, what Milton Friedman would say or what a, what a monetarist would say, because I think that's more interesting. And I think that's where, where we 
a different than a Milton Friedman. And, and, and I think I mentioned this, but Milton Friedman would say that when you increase the money supply, that money very quickly goes into the economy, spreads throughout, and causes a rise in prices. Okay? So if you increase the money supply at a greater pace than the number of goods being created, than productivity, something like that, then what happens is you get price inflation. And we saw that in the 70s, right? In the 70s, we also have the, these negative interest rates, and prices went up. That's how it manifested itself. What the Austrians say is, that certainly can happen. But that's not necessarily the way it happens. That is that when, interest, when money supply is increased, it doesn't necessarily spread, in a sense, evenly through the economy. Sometimes it goes into a particular industry, a particular area, in a more intense way. And indeed, when interest rates are very low, they have this idea that it goes into consumption and into long-term investments first. And that it can take a long time, years, for the inflation in those two areas, in consumption and in long-term investment, to manifest in higher price inflation. And that's why it's so deceptive to the market and to the Fed, because the Fed targets price inflation. Yet, they're in, so they increase the money supply, no price inflation. They increase it more, no price inflation. And the bubble that's happening over here, whether it's in dot coms or whether it's in housing, doesn't play into the equation at all. Because A, I mean, the danger, of course, is that the Fed now takes into account bubbles. But, you know, then they have to start defining when a bubble is a bubble, and they have no clue how to define when a bubble is a bubble. So the monitors believe that. I mean, Keynes believes, just briefly, that the essence of an economy is consumption. That what happens under capitalism is you get overproduction, you get too much stuff, and people don't want the stuff, and, the way, and therefore that's when you have a recession. There's stuff that people don't want to buy. So the way you get out of a recession is you stimulate demand, aggregate demand. You stimulate them people to buy. This is a very simplistic <laughs> Keynesian view, right? Or, or my view of Keynesian. And they go in and you, know, you give them money, you lower interest rates really, really low. Yes, that's supposed consumption, but that's a good thing. Because without it, the economy wouldn't function. So he views a lot of these facts as positives. You know, we want to get people to buy homes. We want to increase, you know, spending. We want people to consume. Okay. And that the problem is the government doesn't do enough of that. You know, the, Krugman now is attacking, has been attacking Obama for the last few months for the stimulus package being too small. Right? He believes that we got out of the Great Depression in World War II when we massively spent a huge percentage of GDP on a stimulus package. And that the problem with FDR, the reason FDR, nothing he did worked, is because it was too small. He was too, you know, he was naive and he was too, uh, too much of a free marketer. He didn't, you know, he didn't go all out and didn't take Keynes seriously enough. The Fed artificially sets interest rates based on fiat or, or whatever, whatever models they use. Um, how much is there a rational hedge of sorts that are market driven? Would it be the currency trade? How, you know, where does rationality come around? Sure. So, if the Fed sets interest rates, can the markets adjust to that? That is, to what extent can the markets take into account the fact that the Fed is setting them wrong? And adjust to it, uh, you know, and, and counteract it, which is, which is really uh, the school that comes out of Friedman, it's called Rational Expectations, you know, would say, it doesn't matter what the Fed does. We're all smart. The markets are really, really smart. And what they'll do is they'll neutralize it through their impact on financial markets. They'll raise long-term rates, so they'll do something else. And I used to believe that. <laughs> and I don't anymore. And I think... Once you understand the complexity uh, or the destructive nature of what the Fed does, I think you realize that there is no way to neutralize it. That is, yes, if the Fed lowers interest rates to 1%, and I know that the real rate should be 4, maybe I can do something, but I don't know what the real rate should be. It's like if, if, if government imposed the price control tomorrow on bread, and they said all bread should sell for $1. Right? And there are droughts, and there's rainy seasons, and there's all the, you know, logistical issues and stuff. And we don't know what the real price of, I mean, we can look at history, but of course we don't have a history with no Fed anymore. Right? We don't know what the real price of bread should be given supply and demand. It's one dollar. 
Now, bet is easy. <laughs> bet is a very easy price. It's a very, you know, it's easy to set. It's easy to figure out supply and demand relative to interest rates. Interest rates are really complex price. So we have no idea what it would be without the Federal Reserve. So that's problem one. Problem number two is most rational expectations thinkers agree with, Green, with uh, Friedman. That is, they believe that when the money supply increases, it manifests itself in inflation. So the way you protect yourself against that is by, is by you know, is by demanding a higher return on long-term bonds, because the idea is that over the long term you need greater compensation because of this inflation, and because long-term bonds become much more expensive, the short term that offsets some of what's going on with mortgages. But the fact is that price inflation doesn't go up, so you'd be stupid to price it up. I mean, if you could, there are plenty of people pricing it down because they look and they say, look, during the Greenspan era, there was no inflation, so he knows what he's doing. So, and the third part is, the markets would have to have deep, deep knowledge of economics, which I don't think they do. I don't think they do. To, to figure out the outcome of what particular government policy is going to be and be able to trade on it requires real understanding of what are the consequences of that outcome is. And I believe nobody knows. Even somebody, even, a, even a, the best economist in the world can say, all he can say Qua sitting Q1 2003, you can say, this is bad. Interest rates are 1%. Something bad is going to happen. It could be price inflation. It could be a bubble. I don't know where the bubble is going to be, but it could be a bubble. It, you know, it could be, those are the two things that are likely to happen. But where is it going to happen? What's going to happen? And then lastly, and we talked a little bit about this, I think, how do you tell where in the bubble you are? Because you could short, right? When If you notice that it's housing, you could go in and sell houses. You could go in and short stocks of home builders. You can go in and, but that is incredibly risky. Because what if you're at the middle of the bubble or three quarters of a bubble? Or, so, you know, these are really difficult things to fix through market processes. So, you know, I, I think I told the other class. So I give an example. Did I give you the example out of the um, internet bubble of shorting a, shorting a bank? Yes. Yeah, I mean, here we made a $200,000 in short position, and we lost a million bucks on it because in, in a period of two days, people decided it was worth five times because they were in the midst of the hysteria. So while we were right long term, you, get, you have to be willing to suffer real, real short-term pain. And that is very difficult. And again, there's so much arbitrariness, and we'll talk about We'll end with a bigger discussion of, of, of government and, and what it really does. So let's, let's, um, let's move on. I want to talk about securitization. Because what happens, so we've got all this government policy, we've got, but why weren't the markets better? Let's put it that way. They couldn't fix it. Maybe why weren't they better at controlling this? Because, you know, we've heard about the securitization market and how so many of these investment banks lost so much money. I mean, these are smart people. Why did they lose so much money? Why didn't, couldn't they get it? So let's look first at what they did. So this is some of the, the collapse, but let's um, start with these. Uh, these are, you know, the variety of different ways to measure leverage. But, but just to give you a sense of leverage, again, Freddie was, uh, was 68. The brokerage houses were around 30 to 1, which is interesting because the brokerage houses in Wall Street were close in terms of leverage to hedge funds. And it's really interesting how the brokerage business, the, the investment banking business, became sometime in the 2000s, shifted their model, their business model. They never used to be hedge funds. They used to make money mostly on transactions, on buying and selling, cutting deals. And suddenly, they started making money off of leverage and off of trading, off of taking positions in the market, off of actual trying to make money on their own capital actually become hedge funds. So, you know, most of these, a big chunk of their business is just running a hedge fund, which is their own capital. Okay. So we'll talk a little bit about that happened. I've got a theory which is not, uh, I, I don't know if, I, I haven't got enough evidence to conclude that this is, this is actually what happened, but my estimate, my guess right now is that Spitzer is actually responsible for that. 
that when Spezza went after the investment banks in 2002-2003, after the dot-com bubble collapsed, Spezza was the uh, attorney general of New York, and he decided that the investment banks were responsible for the internet bubble in some way. They were giving advice and issuing stock, and there were conflicts of interest, and there was research, and that whole business model he did not like. And he sued a bunch of these investment banks. And they never went to court, but what they agreed to was they paid him a huge amount of cap of money. A, that depleted capital, that reduced the amount of capital all these banks had, which meant that it was harder for them to make money. They became more leveraged because they gave out a chunk of equity, a chunk of capital. But second, they needed a new business model. Part of the deal was that they had to separate research from underwriting. They had to do all these changes to their business model that had worked for them for 150 years, something like that. And suddenly, that business model was not acceptable to the Justice Department and to, you know, Elliot Spitzer. And they went out and they, you know, I don't have any evidence that they actually did this, but my guess is they sat down and said, okay, how do we make money? The way we used to make money is not working. You know, and you can add Sarbanes-Oxy to this because American companies start going public and you know, the, the, so the underwriting fees were gone and it, there's a whole change in the, in the environment in which, and I think they chose in some way, whether it was explicit or implicitly, to become more like hedge funds and away from what they traditionally were as investment banks. Yeah, in the back. So, yeah, so was there not a trend towards ETFs and away from paying fees? I think most of the fees the investment bankers made, and again, it, this is not an area of my expertise, was not from individual individuals trading, but it was from cut deals, M&A deals, underwriting, things like that, that had disappeared, but for other reasons. Yeah, Adam. Also, if you look at the percentage of trades that the investment banks were doing, hedge funds became a much larger percentage of that, so that banks were making their traditional trading fees off of the hedge funds and were setting up hedge funds within their own shop, within a shop, and True. that led to the same people saying, aha! Yeah, so they were dealing primarily with hedge funds in this trading volume, and they were saying, wait a minute, why, why you, these guys are not any smarter than us, indeed, most of them are former us, right? They're us five years from now, why not just do it in-house? And some of them set up their own hedge funds, but more than just setting up their own hedge funds, they started behaving like hedge funds. And I think they started taking on risk, leverage, and a lot of the characteristics of, of hedge funds. And you can see commercial banks are at about 10 to 1, which is where the regulators allow them to be, and that's where they are. And these are, these are the pure, smaller commercial banks, credit unions, saving and loans. They're all regulated about the same and all going to be at about 10 to 1. Now, even 10 to 1, as we talked about when we talked about fractional reserve no banking, is nuts. No, in no way in a free market would you get a depository institution, an institution that takes in deposits and checking accounts, having a, a debt-to-equity ratio of 10 to 1. You know, that, would be, that would be incredibly risky. And therefore, depositors would demand a huge interest rate, but deposit insurance wipes that market um, discipline out. Okay, so let's talk about securitization. Um, so Freddie and Fannie buy these mortgages. Goldman Sachs, you know, J.P. Morgan, they buy these mortgages. What do they do with these mortgages? Well, they don't actually sell the mortgage themselves. What they do is they create a pool of these mortgages. And then they splice it up. And in this graph, they have five slices. It's What they do is say, look, we're going to take, we're going to sell you a security, not the mortgage, but a security. And the first dollar that comes when these mortgages are paid, right, they're paying interest, people, people are paying off, people are paying their mortgages, they're paying interest plus principal every month into this pool. The first dollar that comes into this pool, you get. And you get all the money that comes into the pool until you are fully satisfied. Let's say your return is, I don't know, 5%. Until 5% of the dollar, you know, all the dollars come in to satisfy 5% return, you get it. Okay. Then they sell the next layer, 
and the next layer gets the next dollar that comes in until they're satisfied. And then the next one gets, and you can see the, the five tranches, the bottom tranche was called an equity tranche, and it was the riskiest one because it got the last dollar. Right? Everybody else had to be satisfied before the equity tranche got any money. Okay? So you got a security that said you will get X percent a month, or however they were structured, right? Up until, you know, and you had this kind of preference. You would get the first dollars into this pool, or the second dollars into this pool, or the third bunch of dollars. And these were then rated, you know, the first dollar is the least risky, right? Because somebody's going to pay their mortgage. It's not 100% going to go bust. Somebody's going to pay their mortgage. And you're going to get the money from that mortgage, no matter who it is in the pool. It could be the subprime. It could be the really, really safe one. It could be anybody in that pool of mortgages. And that pool would have all kinds of mortgages. The first dollar paid in, you got. And then the second one was pretty safe because you're getting the second mortgage. And, you know, again, the real risk supposedly was being held at the bottom because let's say if 10% foreclosed, if 10% stopped paying, these guys would still get everything. They'd get everything. It's just the bottom that wouldn't get their money. Okay. And this was a way to take a basket of mortgages, some of them prime, some of them some prime, some of them all in the middle, of a whole variety, and splice up the cash flows from those mortgages for a variety of different investments and adjusted for risk. Okay. And, you know, this is a reasonable way to allocate risk, to allocate cash flows. There's nothing inherently wrong with a structure like this. Now, and then you could take these securities that you got, let's say you got the top tranche, this AAA, and you could take those securities, and then let's say this was from Goldman Sachs, and they went to JP Morgan and bought a security from them and then from somebody else, and you could create another basket, not of mortgages, but of these securities. And you could do the same thing to that. You could tranche that into different levels of cash flow, and, you know, and those would be those would be called CDOs, collateralized debt obligations. And you could, you know, and you could then, the CDOs could get tranched, and then you could do this something called CDO squared. And it gets pretty complicated, and then the math gets pretty complicated just to track these things. But the idea is pretty simple, right? You take a basket of a wide variety of mortgages, and you split it up, and you can allocate different risks. And again, you know, the first layer, as long as most people are paying their mortgages, you're fine. Even if a minority of people are only paying their mortgages, you're probably fine. Okay. So this, people can choose their risk. If you want single A, single A is more risky than triple A. You can get that. If you want the real risky stuff, which is the equity, you can hold that. The banks typically, these, the people who did the securities typically held the equity themselves. Okay. So this is just a financial way of allocating risk and allocating cash flows to a variety of different entities. Now, who would buy some of these tranches? Well, the buyers were typically pension plans, insurance companies, institutional investors out there. And those institutional investors, particularly those that were buying kind of the AAA and the higher rated ones, are heavily regulated. Pension plans are heavily regulated. You can only buy certain types of securities. And they, they have to have those securities rated by specific rating agencies. And we'll get to the rating agencies in a minute. But they, had to, they have to, so they can buy AAA securities. They can buy the equity portion. They're regulatory prohibited from doing that. And they can only buy securities that are rated by the rating agencies. They're not allowed to buy just any security they want out there. It has to be rated by specific rating agencies. Okay? So a lot of these securities are now being held by pension plans, by others. There's also, um, you know, European banks bought these. A lot of the problems we're seeing in European banks is because they held a lot of these securities. Okay? And you can see what happens when the foreclosures happen and home prices go down and the riskiness of all this really, really changes. Okay? Suddenly, 
the A and double A might not get the money. Because right? money's not, people are not paying their mortgages anymore. Things that looked safe are not safe anymore. But one of the ways in which, one of the ways you could take something that was more risky, not a AAA, and turn it into, in a sense, a AAA, was to buy insurance on it. So let's say you're a pension plan, and you've got some securities that are not the highest rated securities. How do you get them to be safer? Well, one way to get a risky asset to be safer is to buy insurance. So if these assets fail, you get the money back, right? The difference between what you collect when they go bankrupt and what you would have collected if they hadn't gone bankrupt. And that insurance, again, to simplify, that insurance policy is a CDS. It's a credit default swap. Put aside the language and this is insurance on the default, if just in case the bond defaults. And you had credit default swaps on these CDOs, on these pools. What happens if these pools can't pay out? Now, why did people want this insurance? Why did we have these insurance policies? Well, because, again, insurance companies, pension plans, others wanted to be able to buy these securities, but they needed cover. They needed to be able to treat them as if they were AAA securities when they were not. For regulatory reasons, buying insurance created that. You also had situations in which banks who held these CDOs, they had a whole a lot of reserves for them because they were risky. Remember their fractional reserve stuff? Right. Different accounts, different types of assets are going to require more reserve or less reserve depending on how risky they are. One way to be able to free up capital to make other investments was to lower the risk of these CDOs. And you lower the risk by buying insurance. Okay. Now again, credit default swaps, there's nothing wrong with credit default swaps. It's an insurance policy. Now, there might be a case to be made, and I don't know the details again of this, that in a completely free market, you would just buy insurance, and there'd be insurance products, and this is kind of a, a, a way to get around certain regulations that prohibit buying insurance directly, but it's basically a form of insurance that the financial markets were providing. Okay. Yeah? Maybe I'm confused between the different insurance segments here, but it sounds like the insurance companies are essentially triple risk assigned. You've got mortgage insurance that's out there. You've got bond insurance that's out there, and in some cases the insurance companies are also purchasing some of these securities, so doesn't that mean that essentially, if it's the same companies or related companies, that they're tripling their risks? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's going to be different companies, and it's again, the, 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 the CDSs are not being issued, so aren't they tripling the risk? There's mortgage insurance, there's bond insurance, there's, there's now this derivative form of insurance. If the same company holds all three of them, aren't they tripling the risk? I think that these are different entities, primarily. Now, the derivative is something that is tradable. So what, is a, what happens with a credit default swap? I basically say, I'll make up the difference between what happens in bankruptcy and between what you would have got, and you pay me a, a, a payment, right? Now, uh, anybody can issue that. It doesn't have to be an insurance company, right? And indeed, most of the, most of the issues, AIG happened to do it, but not as part of its insurance company role. It really did it out of its financial arm, which, is more, uh, which was more of, a, a, a tra more of an investment bank than it was an insurance company. The insurance companies, which are heavily regulated by the states, had no CDSs. The CDSs were all held at the holding company level, which was not regulated as an insurance company. And Lehman held CDSs, and Goldman had CDSs. And, and then the other thing you could do with the CDS, with, an, with this type of insurance, is I could say, it, it, imagine it's life insurance, right? You, you buy life insurance, if I die, I get a certain payment, and in the meantime, I make payments. But imagine that, that I could then go out and say, I'm going to buy life insurance on Evan's life. If he dies, I get paid, right? I don't, you know, I have no let's say, interest in Evan's life one way or another, but if he dies, I get paid. Well, 
you could do that with the bonds, right? If bond A, if this particular CDO is going to default, I get paid. And that's why people talked about this notional value being tens of trillions, because there was a lot of speculation, people using these insurance policies, to speculate on the fate of companies. So, for example, there was a lot of trading, the CDS market, this insurance market, predicted Lehman's going bankrupt well before anybody else suspected it would happen, because people were buying policies on Lehman. <laughs> And what would happen to the price of those policies as people were buying more of them, and therefore the, the, the market's estimate of Lehman's bankruptcy is going up, what's going to happen to the price? They're going to get more and more expensive. Say if originally to, to bet on Lehman dying cost me a million dollars, then soon it went up to $10 million, and that price said the market expects Lehman to go bankrupt. It wasn't a short sellers, although they were participating as well, shorting Lehman stock, selling Lehman stock. But it was in the insurance market. It was like, we all know something about Evan. <laughs> Don't take this personal. Uh, you know, he, we know he's sick. He doesn't know he's sick. And we all start buying insurance policies on him. And if we have that ability to have information about Evan that he doesn't have, then people could look and say, yeah, Evan's in real trouble because all these people believe he's going to die, right? We know there's a hit, right? Uh, <laughs> So that's the kind of, I mean, that's what was going on. And that's why this market could be huge, well bigger than the actual bonds that were being insured. Because you could insure a bond you didn't own. Because the way you bet on Lehman dying was not betting on Lehman dying. You were betting on a default of Lehman's bonds. Now, usually you would do that to protect your, the bond of Lehman's that you held. But now you could do it without even holding the bond. And that's why it was such a huge market. And again, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. That's a way to make money, and it's a way, it, it's a way information was conveyed to the market, for example, about Lehman's bankruptcy. The market understood what was going on with Lehman well before, and with AIG, well before regulators did, well before even management at Lehman did. I mean, it's, it's often the case that management has its head stuck in the sand, particularly, as we'll see in a minute, when they believe they're going to get bailed out and they're not going to get bankrupt anyway. Okay, so this is all pretty complicated, right? <laughs> I mean, there's a lot going on here. We've already talked about interest rates, Fetty, Fanny, CRA, all that stuff. And then we add on to that these securitizations and collateral debt obligations and credit default swaps. And so given all this complexity, you know, why didn't the market see it coming? Why were people buying these securities? Why were the prices of CDS not much higher, you know, three years ago? Why didn't everybody behave more, you know, from our perspective today, looking back, more rationally? Why is it that so many really, really smart people were duped? Or were they just, as most critics say, they were just greedy. They could flip these mortgages around very quickly. They could mark a lot of money. I mean, these guys who securitized it then pushed it out to other investors by, by tranching it. They didn't hold the default risk anymore. They didn't care what happened to mortgages. Of course, it turns out that they did because they turned out to hold a lot of the stuff and buy other investment bank stuff. Why was Wall Street bamboozled? You know, again, these are really, really smart people. And why did they take on so much risk? I mean, we're not talking about one investment bank getting into trouble or, or two investment banks getting into trouble. We're talking about the entire industry getting into trouble. We came very close to Wall Street being wiped out. I mean, it is wiped out in the sense that the existing investment banks have now become commercial banks. Why? To gain the protection of, you know, the government. Right, because commercial banks were being bailed out, so you become a commercial bank, and in a sense, in the hope of being bailed out. Right? And it's not just the investment bank; it's the larger commercial banks got into it. I mean, the whole array of the, the, the Wall Street or the financial industry got into this and got into these securities and blew up. And how can we explain it? And and you know, this is what Greenspan said. The bottom line is this is where it failed. You know, I thought that people would watch out for themselves. By watching out for themselves, they wouldn't take on this kind of risk. They wouldn't do these really silly things. And therefore, this would be the correction, the corrective mechanism. Now, as you start peeling away what was going on, you, you know, unsurprisingly, you start finding government 
almost everywhere. So let's start with these ratings. These ratings of all these different things, with all these different entities, turned out to be all wrong. They turned to be all wrong. And the question is why? Why were the ratings wrong? Again, capitalism, right? Rating agencies are crucial for capitalism. Well, a couple of things. It turns out that if you look at the history pre the 1970s, the rating agencies, and there's three of them today, uh, S&P, Moody's, and Fitch, were pretty small entities and pretty unimportant, and nobody paid any attention to their ratings. People would do their own research. It would be nice to have that research corroborated by a rating agency, but it wasn't crucial to the markets. People weren't buying, selling, trading based on what the rating agencies did. However, in the 1970s, as the major investors in the markets uh, grew, and it was clear that those major investors were all what we consider public entities. They were pension plans, private and public pension plans. They were insurance companies. They were these, they were mutual funds. They were these very large entities that very quickly became the dominant investors, the dominant participants in the markets. And the government said, look, we need to watch out for these, for these guys, right? We need to watch out for these entities. We don't want pension plans to fail. We don't want insurance companies to fail. So what we're going to do is we're going to set some standards by which they invest. And we're going to require them not to take on too much risk. And this is part of ERISA. Those of you know the ERISA, which established the, the, the whole pension structure. And they set up certain criteria, but they said, well, how do we monitor this? Well, we're going to grant these rating agencies, these three rating agencies, the ability to rate securities. And then they were going to require the pension plans and others to only buy securities that are rated. And that will make it possible for us to assess the riskiness of their investment. And we're going to actually tell them how many, what AAA investments they can make and, you know, proportion of risk that they can take and so on. But it has to be one of these three because we're going to certify these three as government certified. So if I'm a pension plan and there's some other private rating agency over here that says, no, this is really safe, but Moody, S&P and Fitch haven't authorized it, I can't touch it. I have to follow the rating agencies that the SEC has approved. So what the government basically created is a monopoly. A monopoly of three, but it's still a monopoly. There's no competition. They're all government certified. They're all paid by the people that they're rating, which in a market, you know, wouldn't tolerate, I don't believe. Right? So there's a huge conflict of interest. But nobody can compete them out of business because the SEC is only approved three. <laughs> Right? So you've got a better system of rating, you've got a different business model, tough. <coughs> Nobody cares, nobody's interested. So surprise, surprise, the, agency, the rating agencies don't do a good job. They have no incentive, no competition. And, and, you know, and this isn't the first time the rating agencies screwed up. They, they had uh, Orange County, where I live, Orange County went bankrupt, I think it was in 94, and they were AAA just before they went bankrupt. Enron was AAA just weeks before it went bankrupt. Okay. So the rating agencies have not been great for a long time. People knew that, and, the, and hedge funds don't use rating agencies because they don't need to. The regulators don't force them to, so they don't use them. They don't pay attention to them, and the hedge fund business has come out of this, you know, a lot of people lost a lot of money, but relatively healthy out of this. And quite a few hedge funds have made money during this crisis. You know, the average, the average return for a hedge fund in 2008 was negative 18%, which is pretty bad. But we consider what the S&P and the Dow did during 2008, it's really good. And a lot of hedge funds actually had positive rates of return. So the rating agencies played a huge role here in, you know, in, in, in uh, rating these securities as a lot safer than they really were. And that had a lot to do with their protected status. Now, what else does protection provide you? What else happens when you have protected status? You're much more in impacted by government influence. So imagine if the rating agencies in 2003, 2004 said, you know what? 
All this mortgage stuff is way, way riskier than it should be. We're going to downgrade everything. Can you imagine what Barney Frank would have done? You're destroying home ownership in America. You're, you know, you're racist. You're destroying the ability of the poor to own homes. There was enormous political pressure on them to keep this game going. And as long as people were willing to buy because they, they trusted the rating agencies, because they had to, they had no choice, this market kept going. Okay? So the raging agencies are not an example of capitalism. <laughs> Heavily regulated, controlled, only three of them. Now there's another element to add to this in terms of the rating agencies, and this is the kind of models they were using. And this is true of the investment bankers as well, to a large extent. One of the things that is true in, uh, in math is that it's very easy for us to deal with normal distributions, right? A lot of, a lot of models that rating agencies use, investment bankers use, inve hedge funds use, are statistical-based models. And statistical-based models, you can deal with normal distributions. Normal distributions are pretty, they're easy, you can add them up, you can subtract them. There's a lot of math you can do with them, and they're easy to model. But life, particularly in the financial markets, is not a normal distribution. It's pretty well known that they're not. They, they tend to have, they look a little normal, and then they have what's called fat tails. They have high probabilities of outlier events, of events way out there happening. You know, you know what a normal distribution is? Okay. It's a bell curve of the probabilities of an event happening. And the idea is that most events happen in the middle and it tapers out. As you get to the more radical events, it tapers out. Okay. Well, in reality, stock prices tend to function what well, looks like a bell curve, but then their probab the probability of a big either downturn or upturn, there's a high probability those things will happen. The way that they happen. Right? Um, there's also a book called, uh, a, a, an awful book in many respects, but also a very clever book in other respects called Black Swan, which says there's always a black swan. Black swan is a, is a freaky kind of unexpected event. But the thing about freaky unexpected events, they happen all the time. They're just different. Every time it's a different freaky unexpected event. But we don't know how to model that. You can't put that into a mathematical formula. There's no way to, to express that easily. I mean, there are ways, but it, it's very hard to do. And the mathematical models that were being used here were primarily models based on these normal distributions and things being normal, and they were based on data from history. Now, I showed you the historical data on housing. What does it show? Prices Price flat to going up, never going down. Or if they go down, they go down a little, like they did in the early 90s, maybe. But they recover and nothing happens. So they're based on everything being normal, right? They're not based on a bubble. They're not based on interest rates below the real rate of return. For that, you have to think economically. You have to add something to the model. You have to bring knowledge. Knowledge people didn't have. Knowledge people didn't know they needed to look for. Nobody's ever taught them that there's something beyond, that the economic principles at play here. And numbers were plugged into models and answers came out. Now, I'm not against mathematical models. The models are very useful. In this context, as a first estimate, they're great. As a second estimate, they may be great. But then you have to apply judgment. You have to evaluate them. Does this make sense? What else do I know about the world? Reason, right? Rationality has to be applied. You can, it's not, you know, you can't treat these as black boxes. Now, they are black box models. Black box means you don't, you don't evaluate what's going on. But not in cases like this. You know, for those of you who know what I'm talking about, because I won't explain. You know, mathematical models are very useful in arbitrage. You can use them to arbitrage, and that's how the better mathematical models have evolved, is arbitrage models. But most models that just predict into the future, like capital asset pricing model, are useless unless a lot of judgment is brought into play. Okay. Judgment wasn't brought into play. Certainly not at the rating agencies. You know, I'm sure that some of the hedge funds did, and they did better. You know, some banks evaluated these models better than others, and some banks did better than other banks. 
But in general, there was, there was a lot of complacency with the mathematical models. So we understand why that complacency existed in the rating agencies, but why did it exist in the banks? And I'd argue that, you know, partially it's just lack of knowledge. Partially it's just, you know, they didn't know. And, and history was the way it was, and they just plugged in history. But I would also argue that they were taking on more risk than they should have. They probably knew, and I think they knew they were taking on a lot of risk. You could see it in the leverage ratios. They were behaving in a very cavalier way towards risk. And I think there are two explanations for this. One is what's called too big to fail. Too big to fail means that the Federal Reserve will not let a big bank fail in the United States. The Federal Reserve or the regulatory agencies, the government, will not let a big financial institution fail. This is a doctrine that was really established in the 1980s uh, under Volcker and then under Greenspan. The, the classical case of too big to fail was Continental Illinois, which was at the time the largest bank failure in American history, 1984. It was in, in uh, Chicago. It was, I think, the eighth or eighth or tenth largest bank in the U.S. at the time. It failed. Nobody, other than the shareholders, no debt holders, no depositors, nobody lost money in that bank. You could have had $100 million under deposit, and you were paid in full. The government stepped in, took over the bank, ran it, paid off everybody, and ultimately sold what remained. And it was understood from that point on that no large financial institution will ever be allowed to fail. And Nobody really thinks about that, you know, when you're running a business. You don't really think about that. You don't sit down and say, well, I can never fail, so this is what I'm going to do. But it creeps into the decision making. It creeps into your cost of capital. It creeps into the amount of risk you're willing to take. And it's usually not a big jump. Oh, too big to fail. Let's get really risky. It usually takes years and years and years, but you become riskier and riskier and riskier and riskier. And while shareholders often get wiped out, the debt holders almost never get wiped out. The government always bails them out. So the debt holders who are supposed to be the ones more sensitive to risk, right? Equity, shares are always riskier than debt. Debt has the priority in bankruptcy. So debt doesn't like and debt gets no reward for risk, right? If, 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 if you take on a lot of risk, you make a lot of money, who gets the profit? The equity, the people who put up the equity. The debt holders always get their return, 5%, 10%. That's the coupon they get. They get 5% or 10%. They don't make anything on the upside. On the downside, they lose. So the debt holders who are supposed to be really, really sensitive to risk are not sensitive to risk because they're going to get bailed up. So it's the way they write the covenants on the bonds, which are the, kind of the legal agreements. It's in the interest rates. It's in a bunch of things. And that leads these financial institutions to take more and more and more and more and more risk. So that's one. And that's, I think, been talked about quite a bit. But I think the second, which is in a sense of, uh, you know, uh, uh, bigger than too big to fail. And it was, it's called, a lot of people have called it the Greenspan put. The Greenspan put. Now, what is a put? <laughs> a put is a type of option. Okay. It's a way you make money on the downside. If things go bad, you make money on a put. And the Greenspan put was viewed as this notion, that Alan Greenspan, a chairman of the Fed, will not let the economy go into a major recession. And if the economy never goes into a major recession, none of these things that the investment bankers were doing were risky. Because as long as the economy was growing, they'd make money somehow off of them. So a depression would never happen. A major recession would never happen because Alan would never let it. And he was, after all, God. The maestro. The maestro. He conducted the economy. He did, this is the champion of ca capitalism being called a maestro. Right? Capitalism doesn't have a maestro. It's the whole point. The pricing system is the maestro of capitalism, if you, if you need a, a metaphor. So the Greenspan put said, it's never going to happen. And Greenspan proved that, right? So when banks got into big trouble in the 1980s with Latin America debt, what did the Treasury and the Fed do? They bailed out Mexico. 
And the idea is not so much because they cared about Mexico, but because they wanted to make sure that the Wall Street firms didn't lose money on the debt to Mexico and again, created the economy. When 1987, the stock market in one day went down 25%, October 19th, I think it was, 1987, one day in 25%, Greenspan was on the phone immediately. I will provide liquidity. I will do whatever it takes. I'll lower interest rates. I'll do whatever it takes. So this isn't lasting. So this is a one-time thing. And indeed, the market recovers almost immediately. And by the end of the year, this is October, by the end of the year, it's made most of it back. By, by 1990, it's all back. During 19, no, earlier than that, it's already all back. We had a recession uh, in, in December of 1991. The U.S. was in a recession during the period. The American banking industry was on the verge of bankruptcy. This time because of commercial real estate. Uh, literally, the FDIC was bankrupt. It denied it, but it, was, it, it, was, it had no money to pay off depositors if more banks had gone in default. I remember a Nightline show with the head of the FDIC and uh, what was his name, um, the guy who used to run Nightline? Ted Koppel, Ted Koppel asking him, uh, so you, and, and they had Ed Crane there who was, uh, was one of the experts in the SNL crisis, a really good economist. And Ed Crane's saying, FDIC is bankrupt, they have no money, if there are more bank defaults they can't pay it out. And the guy from the FDIC say, oh no, we're well capitalized, there's no problem, we have lots of money. And if you look back, they were gone. They, were, they had negative balances, they were already borrowing money from the treasury. So he was lying through his teeth. What did Daniel Greenspan do? slashed interest rates. The sharpest decline in interest rates in American history happens in early 1992. So that the, rece- the banking industry is saved and the recession of 92 is a, is a mild recession. And you could argue that that slashing of interest rate in 92 and then another slashing of interest rate in 98 are really the origins of the internet bubble. And then what happens after the dot-com bubble bursts and 9-11 happens and the U.S. should go into recession because there was huge misallocation involved in the dot-com bubble. And then 9-11 was obviously an economic catastrophe and a realignment of our priorities, a realignment of what's important to us, a realignment of where we wanted to spend money should have happened. What happened? Well, uh, Bush comes out and tells us to go to the mall and shop, and Alan Greenspan slashes interest rates so that we don't suffer a recession. So the recession was, again, a mild recession. We came out of it. The Great Moderation, it was called. The new era of moderate economic fluctuations. No more volatility. No more big recessions. No more depressions. It couldn't happen. Now, if you believe that, and I think people believed it, and Greenspan did everything in his power to convince us of the truth of that, and he believed it. If you read his book, he believed in his own greatness, power. And Bernanke believed it. Bernanke, after all, had done his research on the Great Depression. He knew how to combat depressions. If you believe that, what are you going to do? You're going to take on more risk. You're not going to worry. The economy's never going to go into a tailspin. Things will always straighten out. The Federal Reserve, they know what they're doing. They'll smooth it out. We'll get out of it. It always happened before. It's going to happen again. So if you take too big to fail, and if you take the Greenspan put together, you get people taking on huge amount of risk. And it's just the incentive built into the system. Why would they do anything else? And then if you add the rating agency, you can see why the whole system is now pervert, perverted and convoluted. Too much risk. That risk is not properly being measured, not properly being conveyed. And people are behaving, you know, in a sense with blindfolds on. They don't really see what's in front of them. Not blindfolds, more of a fog. A really, really thick fog. Well, you know, you know the moral hazard and the, 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 all these bad government interventions that are happening here in the U.S. are a big thing, but there's been people have talked about, I think they call it linkage, where they're talking about it, it, it may not be the same in the rest of the world. I, I guess, for me, I'm not sure, you know, how big a player we are compared to the rest of the world, and how so, much moral hazard is there in the rest of the world? So how much moral hazard is in the rest of the world, and how big are we relative to the rest of the world in terms of economic... Um, 
Two things. The small has it everywhere because governments mimic the Fed everywhere. And you saw that in Great Britain when they nationalized the bank very, very quickly when it was in trouble, Northern Rock, well before the real magnitude of the, of the problems. Uh, so they already had that moral hazard. Monetary policy is very similar. If you look at the UK central bank, they mimic the Federal Reserve, not quite as dramatically, but they mimicked, and that's why the UK is in more trouble than other places. Europe was a little better than the Fed, and the UK and Europe, mainland Europe, is suffering less. Mainland European banks are suffering a lot because they had leverage ratios even higher than our leverage ratios. They also had too big to fail. They also believed in the great moderation. And they, you know, and they were using the same kind of mathematical models. Um, and I think there are other structural reasons why in Europe uh, they would take on even more leverage and more risk than they did in the U.S. But what about economic linkage? Well, I mean, think about it. We were taking out billions and billions and billions of dollars out of our homes, wealth that wasn't really there money that was created out of nothing. And what did we do with that money? We went to Walmart and we bought Chinese goods. What signal did that send to the Chinese? Huge demand for consumption goods. So the Chinese went on a building spree and American companies went on a building spree in China to build manufacturing plants that provided us with consumer goods, and the consumer goods we were buying. Now the fact that that consumption in a sense wasn't real because, again, they, 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 we were reacting to false incentives providing us by interest rates, perverts the whole structure of production in China. China probably should have been investing in infrastructure. And I'm talking about not roads and stuff. I'm talking about industrial infrastructure, infrastructure to make long-term projects, towards long-term projects, and not in consumption goods. And what's happening right now in China is that they have to completely wipe out much of that consumption industry, because we're not con going to consume it, and oriented maybe to consumption in China itself, and build the infrastructure to make that consumption possible through increasing production in China and increasing wealth in China and doing things like that. So the linking is through the fact that we're still the largest economy in the world, largest financial industry in the world by a long shot. Everybody's tied to us through our financial institutions and through our financial instruments, and everybody's tied to us through consumption. We're tied to us through consumption. Now we're not consuming, the rest of the world is hurting really, really bad. So the linking still exists. It could go away if these other countries restructure correctly, but know what China's doing. China's trying to manipulate that. Again, central planners are coming out and they're, you know, with stimulus packages and so on. Their stimulus package is significantly larger than ours on a, GDP, on a relative basis, much, much larger than ours. So they're going to distort their own economy. So who knows where they're going to go? Yes, and then have to go on. Culturally and politically, how important do you think what was going on in the equity markets was, specifically uh, the professional uh, investors and banks getting away from the P-E ratio as a measurement, starting to trade things on subscribers or you know, part of the actual dynamic culturally, and also the fact that, I, I think this is a fact, that more and more invested, a percent of investment was coming from, you know, quote-unquote Main Street, and did that have spillover or cross-contamination, if you will, into some of these other debt markets within the I, Yes, I think all of that is probably true. That is, the, to what effect the changes in the way stocks were being traded and the parameters in which they were being traded had an impact. But there's a, I could do, you could, you could do a whole course on how the SEC has destroyed the stock market. Because one of the things that happens with the SEC is we all think we're investors. We all think we know how to trade stocks, right? Because after all, there's transparency and we get all the ratios and everything's available and they have to report it and the SEC is protecting us from Madoff, we think. And, you know, and all this stuff is happening. So too many people investing, too many ignorant people investing. And, of course, the dot-com bubble, which I again blame on interest rates, led to this idea of investing based on subscriptions or based on sales or based on anything but profit or anything but actual return. Um, I think, yes, I think the whole mentality of how to trade in the markets is distorted by, uh, by interest rates. And then again, interest rates too low provide two incentives. The consumption, but also the long-term investment. And stocks, equity clearly reflects long-term investment. So you get a bump up in equity prices as a consequence of money flowing in there. Because what happens when interest rates are low? You do a discounted model, 
right? Stock prices look a lot cheaper than they really are when interest rates are 2%, 1% than they would be if interest rates were 5%. So that, a lot of the increase in the stock market price from 93 on, I showed you in the beginning those two peaks, was because interest rates are so low, you discount the future dividends, if you will, the future cash flow you get from the stocks, they suddenly look very cheap, everybody bought them. So I think it's a lot of things going, yes, and they're all interrelated. Okay, let me, let me wrap up with this thought, because I think, I think this is, you know, you see there's a lot going on, but there's one uniform principle here. And this goes back to Peter Schwartz's talk yesterday, I think it was yesterday. When you introduce force into the equation, bad stuff happens. That's the simplification of this principle, right? When you introduce force into the equation, rationality, reason go out the window. You can't think. And here's a literal case. When the Federal Reserve lowers interest rates, you can't think about what the interest rate should be. There's no way to go with that thought. That is a thought that gets chopped off because there's no way to tell where it should be. Where do I look at? What facts of reality can I look at to evaluate where interest rates should be? So it, 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 it eliminates one's ability to think in that way. So I've got this interest rates. Yes, I know it's the Fed determining it. What should it be? I don't know. I'm just going to have to take this price, this interest rate, as if it's the real interest rate. I have no other choice. And so somebody was looking at examples of where force eliminates the ability to reason. That's an example where force, Federal Reserve setting interest rates, eliminates one's ability to reason about interest rates. I mean, what do you, yeah, I mean the best you can do is say it's too low. Okay, but that doesn't tell you much. Not enough to, to, to actually change anything. Okay? But the same is with the rating agencies. The three A rating agencies, they're the only ones. Some investors have to take those ratings purposefully. Okay, are the ratings too aggressive? Are they too not aggressive? What do they mean? Should I use them? Shouldn't I use them? How should I use them? Who knows? I mean, it caps off thought. If the rating agencies were private, there was competition, I could say, well, you know, I can evaluate that. I can tell the better competitors, the worst competitors, who's done better in the past, I can value a track record. But once you introduce force, all of that goes out the window. And force pervades the financial markets. Again, banking, financial markets, mortgages are among the most regulated industries in the country. Now, this isn't a failure of capitalism, this is a failure of force. Force is everywhere here. So it's no surprise that investment bankers made mistakes. Yes, they made huge mistakes. But yeah, that's what happens when you introduce force into the equation through regulations. People can't think properly. They can't think long term. They can't collect the facts because they can't even tell what is a real fact and what's a pseudo fact, what's a government created fact. They don't know what real prices are because interest rates are set by the Fed. So what are the real interest rates? The more force you introduce, the more perverse a market will become. Okay. So the one thing to take away from this course is, is, is this idea. It's not, think of regulations as force. Think of the idea that force destroys reason. And then, you know, if somebody says, look, but the investment banks are irrational here, or this, or this, you know, look at these mortgage bankers, why were they doing this? It's stupid. Yeah, it was. But, you know, what options did they face? What incentives did they have? How were they supposed to tell that it was stupid, given all the, they, after the fact, it's easy, but given the force that they wander, given the influence that they wander. Okay. So, Nothing should surprise you <laughs> when you've got this level of government involvement in a particular sector in the economy. And it's, there's no way to predict how long it's going to take to fix and how long this will happen or that will happen. And this is why I believe trying to predict where we're going from here is impossible. You know, close to impossible. <laughs>
because all we're doing is increasing the amount of force. I don't know how people are going to respond to this force, where they're going to respond. So we've lowered interest rates now to 0%. We've nationalized our auto companies. We've, in a sense, nationalized the percentage of our banking system. What is that going to lead to? What's Bonnie Fang going to come up with tomorrow in terms of what the bank should and shouldn't do? He, he owns them now, right? He's in control. You know. And how is that going to affect inflation or a bubble? Or, I don't know. You know. If he forces the banks to start lending, we'll get hyperinflation. But if he forces them to do something else, we'll get something else. It's, it's not within the realm of you know, reasoned rationality. You can't sit down and say, okay, this is what happens. Well, no, because there's all this randomness that is the element of government that steps in. All we can say is, what's going on today is bad. <laughs> and the outcome is going to be bad. It might be inflation. I mean, prices going up. It might be another bubble. I can't imagine where, but it could be. I happen to think it's probably going to be inflation. It could be a depression. A deflation could continue. You know, you could imagine a scenario in which the banks never lend, where, where we basically continue into spiral downwards and stay in a deflationary environment. You know, anybody want to bet money on it? I mean, what do we do? It's basically gambling, right? I mean, it's, and that's what happens now. In a free market, you don't get into these situations. In a free market, yes, it's not easy to predict the future, but you know what the principles are that guide the future. Okay. You know why things are happening, but now, you know, we don't know why they're happening. They're at the beck and call of Bernanke and Geithner and, and Bonnie Frank. They're the guys who are going to determine what happens and then how the market responds to all that, which there is no one way to respond to them. Okay. So all I can say about the next two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight years, is that it's going to be a mess. There's going to be a huge amount of volatility, a lot, which is a result of huge amounts of uncertainty. People don't know. And anybody who goes out there and says, this is what's going to happen, you know, I wouldn't trust them. So, you know, prepare yourselves. Unfortunately, I have to end on a negative note. But, you know, and I'm, the, I'm always the positive guy. But prepare yourselves for a really rough ride. And it's going to be right, because I think it's going to go up and down, and I think it's going to be very volatile. I actually think we'll get inflation, price inflation, but I, I, I wouldn't put money on that. Um, and, you know, we're going to see if there is inflation, what, what's the cure for inflation? Slamming on the brakes, a deep recession. That recession could spiral into depression. Who knows? Yeah, quickly. Um, I have a question just on the top of inflation. Um, the Fed is now um, paying interest on Fed funds deposits. I, I believe so. That this is a recent change in policy. And you, know, you look at a chart of, of how those Fed funds, I mean, the, the reserves now, the banks have, are just through the roof. The yeah. banks have credited a huge amount. So it looks like incipient inflation. And once they lend that out, it will be inflation. But the Fed can keep those at the Fed by paying interest. Is my understanding that correctly? So just thinking that that's a huge amount of money of reserves that it can actually just sit there at the Fed and never be lent out if they just pay enough interest. Yes, if they, if they keep their interest high enough. But remember, even the interest rate, in a sense, at some point, that's new money that they're putting into the economy. So I don't know how they can keep doing that indefinitely. But so they're doing that and at the same time. They're buying up securities. They're buying up auto loans. They're buying up mortgage-backed securities. They're buying up a lot of consumer loans. And they're buying up government debts. So and they're monetizing a lot of the debt out there and holding this reserve of the banks. Yeah. But if they ever let that reserve shrink and the banks do start lending, and I think the problem with the banks lending is not so much the banks lending. I think it's we're not borrowing, which is a good thing. Right? Um, Again, another one of these reasons why there's a lot of uncertainty. I don't know what, how, what the Fed's going to do in terms of the interest rates they pay on the deposits. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask you about the, the selling of mortgages with the banks instead of, bar, instead of lending and holding, yeah. uh, lend to sell. Is there anything to say that wouldn't happen in a free market? 
And if it did, is there anything wrong with it? No, I don't think I don't think there's anything to say it wouldn't happen. I think it would happen. I think the whole securitization probably would have happened. The contracts might have been written differently, and there might have been an evolution. So, for example, these things might have failed once or twice, and then they evolved different contracts. We don't know. <laughs> I mean, that's a real bottom line is we don't know. I think they would have still created been in existence in the free market. I think the contracts would have been written a little differently so that the bank held some responsibility over the loans, so they'd suffer if the, if the originating bank, say if they suffer if the loan defaulted. I mean, if I were buying